Greetings. Welcome to um, part two of this series on pulse motors and air gaps. Ooh, scary. <laughs> I didn't do that that well. Any, any fans of Second City TV? That's what that goes back to. Ooh, scary. Yeah, it's a good thing I wasn't an actor. But this is amazing, the thing you can spin with an air gap like that. Um, everything's working all right with data gathering so far. It's just, it's really hard just to get things really precise. You know, like if this, if this thing is in a little bit closer, you know, or if it's a little further out, there's nothing, then you have to have it there. So, I mean, I'm trying to do one here top dead center. And, I mean, I can just see top dead center isn't working that well right there. If I have this thing just like that lined up that with the edge of that um and now it doesn't do a damn thing well i, I must have pulled the wire out it doesn't matter um so then i i gathered all this data with this air gap and now what i'm going to do is i'm going to cut the air gap in just about in half and repeat everything there's already stuff even with this this huge air gap that's a little bit odd and also, I mean, it just takes forever to spin up. It takes minutes and minutes for it to reach a stable speed. So let me um, let me fix up the machine here, and we'll we'll change the air gap. And ooh, all right, I kind of done that one to death. Ooh, scary. And we'll see what happens then. So here I've I've dropped the air gap by about half. About the only thing that didn't work real well is I'm trying to get a resistive load of some sort. And, you know, you could think of like, you know, doing like a hands-free and putting like some copper brush there or something. But I don't know how consistent it would be. I mean, it'd be hard to keep that consistent. So my idea is a pickup coil. But because I'm moving this thing up and down, the pickup coil wouldn't be in the same place. It has to go along with there or, well, that's what I should have done. I should have taken a thin coil. And put it under there and then okay um, but right now what I'm doing is I'm just running the thing sideways it's catching a little bit you know you get a little bit of voltage and then I'm basically almost shorting it with like a 10 ohm resistor to try and get some resistance on there and see how the thing responds but it gets so little voltage I'm having trouble slowing the thing down but if I can find if I can find a coil that will fit under there then problem solved. So now I put the sensor back in the same place. I dropped this. I've just copied and pasted this and then I'll explain what all these are as we put them in with the new air gap. So when I connect this now it should spin. Oh! Scary. Scary. <laughs> I wish I could stop doing that. John Candy, I can't remember the other guy. I can't even remember what the skits were about. It was just uh, the guy dressed up as a vampire. and They would show things that weren't scary and try to make them scary. So I can already tell you this has got more torque and it seems to be spinning faster. So now that it's spinning, and I wish I'd known this with the non-analog so that I wouldn't have fried all the fuses. Now I'll hook it up. And it's drawing less amps. So what we're doing now is we're going to go and look at the freewheeling one. The offset again is at 22 degrees on the sensor. I haven't changed that cutoff value in the code. That could You could do pulse width modulation with that and that'll be perhaps another video in itself. I haven't checked the voltage. It's going to have dropped some. So I'm going to do that now. Okay, well, it's reading 4.078. It's down from 4.116 when I was doing all that. I'm, I'm calling it 4.077 because I'm going to leave this that number the same for all of these. Just hopefully it'll, it'll uh, be fine. I mean, you know, so you might be off by like a half a percent or something, but I think that'll be fine. But now, where where are we right now? We're in the freewheeling. We've got a 22 degree offset. That's this. Now, what's the milliamps that we're drawing? 
Okay, the milliamps, if we can... Let me use the light on the camera. The milliamps, I would call that... It's on the 250 scale. 250. So I would call that 75, wouldn't you? I mean, it looks exactly at 75. I think that's what it is, 75. So, instead of 112, the milliamps are now 75. So I'm going to jot that in. So that's a little weird already. I mean, you're bringing the electromagnet closer to those magnets, and the amp draw is, has dropped from 112 to 75. Let's see what it's spinning at. Yeah, I think that's correct. I don't see any decimal places there. Pretty darn sure that's correct. We're doing a cool 1,125 RPMs. So that's uh, twice as good. Amp draw is about half. So everything, it's not slowing down yet. It's speeding up tremendously. So over here, and again we're freewheeling, the spike voltage 79.1 before it was 79.7. So 79.1. Um, the next thing to do is put a uh, 1k ohm resistor across this. Yeah, hopefully don't, you know, we don't, ooh, it blowed up good. <laughs> One second, city TV. Sorry. Okay, so 10, 10k, or 1, 1k is across there. This is bouncing between 2.8 2.9. Come on. Uh, 2, I'll call it 2.9. So this went from 2.2 to 2.9, despite the open voltage being a little bit lower. So. That's a little interesting too. Um, what's next? What's next? Let's look at the let's look at the speed. Yeah, isn't that goofy? It sped up. Now it's going 1,150, and that's that's something you see with the pulse motors. Got no idea why. Now, if you put enough across there, and I'll show you that, then that goes away. But um, with a high resistance load across there, and that'll be the subject of another video. I mean, if you're actually pulling this off, there might be a most efficient place power-wise, you know, between 100 ohms, 1K, 10K. I mean, what do you, where should it, assuming that you could pick whatever resistance you wanted, what would you want to pick? So went from 1125 to 1150 and yeah you see with these pulse motors I mean they're real low torque but they like to go fast so I mean now it's all the way up to 1158 it might even go a little higher and if you had you know like magnetic bearings who knows how fast it would go let's see what our amp draw has done let me see if I can get a light on it What am I missing there? 50, 60, it's the exact same. I don't think it's budged. So that is, um, you know, I mean, it's like 1% back, <laughs> but that's free. You know, I mean, there's no, the amp draw didn't budge and the rotor sped up. And now you're getting a tiny, teeny bit back. So it's like, you know, that's what you want to, want to engineer for, is improving all of that. But so far, that's free. The thing with the pulse motors, I mean, they take a long time to, to actually spin up fully. They have very little torque. They run with very little current, but they have very little torque. It's not consistent. So, I mean, this is kind of garbage. This this part is sort of garbage. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, 
And this is really what I wanted to see. So what, uh, you know, I was saying, well, first that I'm disappointed that I can't figure out how to, how to consistently gather data with the constant resistance on here. Um, oh, well, but I mean, you can certainly tell that this thing's got more torque. I mean, it's spinning faster and it also spins up quicker, but it takes about the same amount of time for it to reach, you know, fully spinning. But that's the other thing is, you know, people talk about um, like flyweight, uh, you know, using a flyweight, flywheel rather, a flywheel with this. And you, it does kind of actually make sense. I mean, I'm not saying whether there's something to it or not yet because I haven't looked at it, but it does kind of make sense because you could think you're getting this pulse, 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 and they're brief. And then for like 90% of the time, the thing's not doing a darn thing. You know, it's just going with momentum. So let's say you had a real strong resistance where this thing is spinning and a, a tremendously lightweight, well-balanced rotor. Uh, so this is like an absurd example, but this is why I'm saying, yeah, maybe flywheels do something. So let's say you had a resistive load here where you're spinning at a thousand RPMs. It hits the resistive load and slows down to a hundred RPMs it hits a pulse and because the thing is just so astonishingly lightweight it shoots back up to a thousand rpms goes down to a hundred rpms with the resistance shoots up to a thousand rpms and so your average is going to be like you know uh, 400 rpms but really you're getting like a hundred rpms and you can pretend that resistive load is a is a pickup coil now let's say you spin this thing up and it weighs 10 times as much. Now it comes back past there and it goes from, instead of 1,000 down to 100, it goes from 1,000 down to 900, hits this, and then goes back to 1,000. Now let's make it 100 times as heavy. It goes from 1,000 RPMs down to 990 RPMs. And so that's, I think, the improvement that you get when you add momentum to a pulse motor. So, um, it's not, you know, it just should lead to a higher average speed going past a coil. So with this thing nearly shorted across 10 ohm, I, I can't believe it dropped to, yeah, 0 0.132. I, I was putting down 0 0.218. I must have meant 0 0.0218 on the other one. I bet you I did because that thing started at like one volt and it was across, it was across the same or maybe I put it across a 100 ohm resistor or whatever. I wish I had thought a little more clearly on how I was going to gather data on that. But it's, it's fine. We're okay. Hold everything. So, I mean, as you'd expect, I mean, what we can see is it's dropped to um, about 948 RPMs. Now, from what I've read, and this is like with hobby motors, which, you know, they're not entirely different than a pulse motor. With a hobby motor, there's a point between when it's freewheeling, you know, and then, of course, if you just short, you know, just hold the thing, then it pretty much, you know, is always in an on position, like 90% of the time. I mean, they don't, they don't want to have a place where it's not in an on position or else... You know, you could have a situation where you hit the go button and it doesn't do anything. Whereas a pulse motor, 90% of the time it's in the off position. Um, but to get neither here, you know, being neither here nor there. With a traditional motor, and you know, they have the curves for it and everything. But basically, between the freewheeling to when it's actually just stopped, it's about when it's down to about 70% of its freewheeling speed that you get the maximum out. And, you know, I mean, they have some very efficient motors that, you know, I, I don't know, maybe you would get like better than 90% back or something like that. I'm not really up to speed on all that. I think that, but yeah, I mean, I think like the Tesla motors are more than 95% efficient. Um, what is the same does the same apply with the pulse motor so in other words i mean how much should you slow it down in order to get the most out of a i don't know why i'm pointing that coil the most out of a pickup coil 
compared to the power that you're putting in. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm guessing that it'd be the same as with a uh, with a traditional electric motor. That's my guess. But I didn't do a good job trying to sort this out. So let me stop. Let me stop complaining. We'll do one more thing with this, and then we're going to drop the we're going to drop the plate again. So what I want to do on this one now is instead of a 1K ohm across the spike cap, I'll put a 100 ohm, so a good bit less resistance. And if it's like with the larger air gap, what you'll see is this thing instead of speeding up, which isn't that weird when you put a 1K across there, it speeds up a little and the amp draw doesn't change. I think it'll now start to slow down a little, but I don't think I don't think there'll be any appreciable change in the amp draw. I don't think the amp draw will change. That's appreciable or otherwise. So, ooh, scary. Okay. And the last time when I did this, it slowed down for a while. And then it kind of got its groove back on. It started picking up speed again. So I'm just going to let it do its thing for like a minute here. And then we'll check the rotational speed in the amp draw. Um, but I think it slowed down a little bit. But we can see we're getting 0.47 out, you know, versus 0.24. That 0.24 is better than the 2.2. The 0.47, ooh, that's, ooh, scary. 0.47 is going to be way better than 3.02, right? Because we just, I mean, yeah, it will be, trust me. Okay, so for some reason the light won't turn on. Nah. Come on. All right, be that way. No, that's even worse, sorry. Give me a second. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing with these cameras. But we can see even with the, um, the 100 ohm there, even though it's slowed down, we're still just rock steady at 75 milliamp draw. Now, it, it may even be 74, but I've been running this thing for like five minutes, so that might be, that might be um, secondary to the battery starting to run down. But what you can see is amp draw is not like going through the roof. If anything, it's, it's um, steady or decreasing. With the 10K, or the 1K, sorry, the rotor sped up. With the 100 ohm, it slowed down. And I don't know, maybe I was talking about this earlier, but that's like what you see when you're charging batteries. When they're dead and you're going to have, you know, like 100 ohms of resistance, the machine slows down. As they charge up, the machine picks up a little bit of speed. And as I said, this is, this is interesting. I mean, that's 0 0.48, 0 0.49, it was saying 0.5. And that's 10 times the resistance versus we were getting 3 or 2.9 there. So you would expect 0.3 with 10 times the resistance, but we're getting 0.5. Here, it was much more subtle with the large air gap. Um, let's just look at the rotational speed. We're at, we're at 100 on the spike. I didn't jot down this stuff here. So we're at 100 on the spike. Well, let's just look at the rotational speed. Okay. Okay. 1141. So it was 1125 when we didn't have any resistance across the spike cap. Jumped up to 1150. Now it's down to 1140. So interesting. So what I'm going to do off camera now is I'm going to look at moving this thing into closer to top dead center. And I, I mean, I can tell you if I can start doing it right now. I mean, that's what you're going to see. <laughs> the amp draw is going to go way up, and this is not going to go up as much. I mean, it went up a little bit there. I'll have to see what happens to the rotational speed and. Because I can't figure out what to do with that yet. The rotational speed is kind of a proxy for 
how much holy moly oh no we were we were at one one five zero never mind <laughs> it's slowing down it's not speeding up i don't know what's going on they, they, so what i'll do sort of off camera here is look at top dead center um i don't think top dead center is the place to be but it it might be and again i'll have to return to this later trying to figure out how to how to have a consistent resistance and you know one big question is is top if these things are close you know i mean maybe it's a little bit worse but you know you have like three times as much torque at top dead center as at 22 degree offset it might be right to go top dead center so that's something i'm trying to figure out but i don't know so I'm just going to take a quick look at that myself, and then what I'm going to do is drop this down to um, to flush with here, which that'll be a fairly small, not a tiny air gap. It'll still be about a quarter inch, maybe even a little bit more, uh, quarter between a quarter inch and a half inch air gap, because you got you know you got this, you got that. Um, but I think this video is. Uh, a lot longer than I expected it to be. So that will be part three. <laughs> Woo, scary. That'll be part three of the air gap and the pulse motor. And uh, um, I'll, I'll try to get that one out to you pretty quick. Okay, so stay healthy, everyone. And uh, uh, thanks for putting up with my Second City TV references. Bye-bye.